I always get a kick when the New York Times publishes something about running and that is what we are going to be talking about today. They actually published a recent article titled what you do and don't need in a running shoe. Now of course the New York Times isn't a running publication so some of this information in the article is going to be a little basic for you and me but there is a surprising amount of other information that you might actually get some use out of or find interesting and there are a lot of links linking to other studies so let's get into it. Before we do get into it, this is also the weekly running and training vlog where the main purpose of this video is for you to tell me about your week of running. I want to hear about your successes and I definitely want to hear about those setbacks. But let's talk about running shoes, eh? So to start off, the article talks about how humans have been running for millennia and for most of that time they didn't have the benefits of running in highly coloured or cushioned running shoes. They then briefly talk about what makes a running shoe a running shoe and how it differs from a basketball shoe. But we don't really care about that. Right? We know what those differences are. What caught my attention was the next subheading asking do specialized running shoes actually do what they say they're going to do. And it turns out that, well, that's not always the case. But you probably figured that out because if they did exactly what they said they were going to do, probably wouldn't be talking about it. But it's not always the case. In fact, they tend to oversell their features. I know, no one is surprised to hear that. So let's briefly talk about stability and motion control shoes. And first I want to know if you run in a stability or a motion control shoe and if it actually has helped you. Because the article does link to a study that suggests that the evidence doesn't quite bear out that stability and motion control shoes have those protective elements. And what I mean is you may not be getting the enhanced protection from injury that you think you're getting when you order a pair of motion control or stability shoes. So pronation is how our body dissipates force. When we're running, it's normal to pronate a little bit. Then there are people that overpronate or supinate. Now the doctor that they interviewed for this article does say that correcting your pronation may cause knee and hip pain. And then he doesn't dismiss that overpronation can cause cause some problems. But what he does point out is that overpronation is very poorly defined. And that's because we're all individuals. What is good for me might not be good for you or what is overpronating for me might not be overpronating for you. You know what I'm saying? We each have our own special way of running. Now, basically it's all the same but there are little intricacies that we all have that we bring to our gait. And if you don't need a stability shoe and you put one on kind of like offering a solution to a problem that you don't have. And look, it's probably not going to cause you too much trouble, but what it's going to do is prevent your foot from moving in its natural way. And that could promote injuries down the road. But with that said, also not correcting that overpronation may result in some injuries down the road. So I guess you have to pick your poison and really decide what works best for you. Now let's talk about max cushion shoes because we're seeing a lot of max cushion shoes. In fact, most of the brands out there are putting out some extremely high stack height shoes. And for me, when I look over here at my shoe wall, I see a lot of shoes that are maximum cushioned. And here's the thing, when you run in max cushion shoes, there have been studies that have shown that you actually increase your impact forces, which certainly goes counter to what we actually might think would happen. If we're running in max cushion shoes and they are more cushioned, surely we're going to be hitting the ground with less force. Not so. And the article in the New York Times actually links to another study that built off the original study that shows that we increase our impact forces when we wear max cushion shoes and it built it out over a couple of weeks. So they did an initial test where they measured the impact forces from someone moving from a low cushion shoe to a max cushion shoe and obviously we already know that the impact forces increase for the runner wearing the max cushion shoe but then they hypothesize that the runner may get used to running in a max cushion shoe and kind of get used to it and then get back into their normal gait and normal impact forces and then they re-measured those runners six weeks later and what they found was that the runner did not get used to running in the max cushion shoe. So even six weeks after starting to run in a max cushion running shoe the impact forces from running are still greater six weeks later. That is something that could contribute to increased running injuries. And actually if we look at long-term running data over the last 40 years we've seen that running injuries have remained very high. Even when we take into account all the great advances, the technological advances that we've seen in running shoes over that time. And more of it, a Cochrane review published in 2022 looked at 12 randomized controlled trials and the evidence from analyzing all those trials and they found that there were actually no running shoes that had injury preventing properties. That is a fascinating takeaway. I mean not good fascinating but bad fascinating. Basically there's no magic pill and by magic pill, I mean magic shoe that will prevent you from getting injured. It all comes down to good training practices, my friends. Okay, let's talk about carbon fiber plated shoes. Now, last week we talked about how carbon fiber plated shoes can result in some injury for some runners, but we're not talking about that today. Obviously, if we run too much in one thing, the likelihood of getting injured probably increases, but I want you to think about super shoes and why you would actually buy super shoes. Because the claims that the super shoe makes is that you are going to run with better economy. So by running in a super shoe, the amount of oxygen that you use to run at a certain pace is going to be less. 
That means when you increase your pace, you're going to be able to run faster at the same oxygen use, right? That's the claim. And of course, there was a study that found that that was actually the case for some runners running at non-elite paces, which is great news for you and me. But that study also found that one third of runners, so 33% of runners, had worse running economy in super shoes than they did running in regular shoes, non-super shoes. That's quite a big number, isn't it? One third, 33% had worse running economy in super shoes. Guys, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad if super shoes don't work for you. Clearly, they don't work for a big segment of the running population. So you're probably wondering what type of shoes should I run in? Man, I have to run in some type of shoes. What should I choose? Well, the article suggests that you should run in neutral daily trainers. The bread and butter of running shoes, the shoes that you grab for most of your miles, those are the shoes that you should be wearing most of the time because they don't really correct anything. All it is is cushion between you and the road. And when you wear neutral daily trainers, they're not correcting anything. They're letting your body run as it wants to run. Now, a lot of you that like running in maximalist running shoes or you like running in stability shoes, you have found that they work for you. The article doesn't actually discount that those types of shoes don't work for everyone. They do work for some people. And there is evidence to suggest that if you have arthritis or plantar fasciitis or, you know, other types of pain in your feet, maximalist shoes can actually reduce some of the pressure, which in turn will reduce the pain, which ultimately brings this article to its best recommendation yet. And that is you should buy shoes on comfort. And that is putting comfort above color. That seems like an obvious one, but putting comfort over technology. So buy a shoe that feels good for you, not what you want the shoe to possibly do for you. Again, I think that is pretty obvious, but it's worth saying. And then they talk about how long running shoes will last. And this is important information because if you watch me, you're probably into running shoes, I would think. And the article links to a couple of studies that have been done in a lab and in real world settings. And those studies suggest that running shoes lost anywhere between 300 and 500 miles, if not earlier than that. So obviously a lot of super shoes, they are not going to last as long as a daily trainer. So even though they are suggesting that you replace your running shoes every three to 500 miles, the article also points out that it isn't exactly clear when that breakdown of your running shoes starts to affect your feet or your legs. So although they're recommending three to 500 miles, we don't know if if it's at that point that you start seeing some negative effects on your body from running in shoes that are too old. I know for me personally, years ago, I used to go to 600 miles on every pair of running shoes. Then when I got a new pair of running shoes, I noticed that they felt really good. And that's the kind of insidious thing with keeping your running shoes too long because you're used to it and you don't notice the breakdown. You don't notice that extra impact forces on your body until you put on a new pair of shoes and then they just feel fantastic. And of course, there are other variables that you have to consider. Perhaps if you run on the road, your shoes are gonna wear down a little more than if you run on trails. And if you have an uneven gait pattern, that could contribute to your shoes wearing down unevenly and at a little quicker rate. And then they get back into some pretty basic stuff talking about if you want your running shoes to last longer, why not only run in them? I guess I wanna know, is there anyone watching right now that actually has their running shoes and they use them for everyday life? type of stuff, but they still use them for running. I know a lot of you out there have your running shoes and when you're done running in them, they get rotated into another area of life, like going to the shops, going to the gym. But let me know if you use one pair of running shoes for everything in life. And with that, I had a pretty good week of running. My volume is coming down. Boston is next week. And my week started off on Monday with 5.1 miles. Now that was a very easy run, but I did do six 30 second pickups with 30 seconds recovery in between, just to get my legs turning over. Because as you know, when you're in the taper, you lower the volume, you keep the intensity somewhat there. You don't drop the intensity as much as you drop the volume. And then on Tuesday, I did 8.1 miles total. I warmed up for one mile, then I did five one mile intervals with 400 meters recovery in between. And then I cooled down for 1.1 miles. Wednesday was a super chill day, 4.3 miles very easy. And then on Thursday, Thursday I knocked out my tempo run, my last tempo run, a bit shorter than I have been doing, but I ran a total of 8.1 miles. I warmed up for two miles, then I did five miles at marathon effort before cooling down for 1.1 miles. Now I did run at marathon effort, not marathon pace or what I think I should be running at marathon pace. I was keeping an eye on my power output and maybe I was a little bit high, but that's what I was trying to do on that run. And I ended the run feeling pretty good, which honestly I should be feeling pretty good when I'm only running five miles at that pace. So we'll see. Honestly, I am really hoping for a cold day at Boston. And then I took Friday off. Now, Friday was my only day off last week. Next week, I'll take a couple more days off. But this week, I'm just lowering the volume on each of my daily runs. Saturday was 4.6 miles, very easy, but I did do seven 30 second pickups with 30 seconds recovery in between. Again, just to get those legs turning over. And then I wrapped up the week on Sunday with eight miles even, but I did run over to the mall and I did run up and down the car park. And that was sort of my last chance at getting some elevation. I say elevation, very 
very tongue in cheek. And you might have seen my video that I posted yesterday. I just kind of filmed when I was out on that run doing those hills. So if you've ever wondered what that elevation, what that hill, what that incline looks like at the mall, go back to yesterday's video and you can see it. And by see it, I mean, you'll see that it's really nothing. But either way, that last run brought my week to 38.27 miles, which is about 61.6 kilometers. So I think I'm right where I need to be in my taper. Next week is going to be super chill like very short runs maybe a couple of 400s on one of those days just to get some speed but volume wise very minimal my friends if you have made it to this point in this weekly running and training vlog first of all thank you very much second of all i want to put the safety goggles emoji in the comments so i know that you've made it to this point point. and with that go enjoy your day enjoy your run don't forget to let me know about your week of running be kind be happy run well i'll see you in a couple of days